The attack on Pearl Harbor was a surprise military strike by the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service against the United States Naval Base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii Territory, on the morning of December 7, 1941. The attack, also known as the Battle of Pearl Harbor, led to the United States' entry into World War II. The Japanese military leadership referred to the attack as the Hawaii Operation and Operation AI, and as Operation Z during its planning, Japan intended the attack as a preventive action to keep the U.S. Pacific Fleet from interfering with its planned military actions in Southeast Asia against overseas territories of the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and the United States. Over the course of seven hours there were coordinated Japanese attacks on the U.S.-held Philippines, Guam and Wake Island and on the British Empire in Malaya, Singapore, and Hong Kong. The attack commenced at 7.48 a.m. Hawaiian time, 1818 Greenwich Mean Time. The base was attacked by 353 Imperial Japanese aircraft including fighters, level and dive bombers, and torpedo bombers in two waves, launched from six aircraft carriers. All eight U.S. Navy battleships were damaged, with four sunk. All but the USS Arizona were later raised, and six were returned to service and went on to fight in the war. The Japanese also sank or damaged three cruisers, three destroyers, an anti-aircraft training ship, and one minelayer. 188 U.S. aircraft were destroyed, 2,403 Americans were killed and 1,178 others were wounded. Important base installations such as the power station, dry dock, shipyard, maintenance, and fuel and torpedo storage facilities, as well as the submarine piers and headquarters building also home of the intelligence section, were not attacked. Japanese losses were light, 29 aircraft and 5 midget submarines lost, and 64 servicemen killed. One Japanese sailor, Kazuo Sakamaki, was captured. The surprise attack came as a profound shock to the American people and led directly to the American entry into World War II in both the Pacific and European theaters. The following day, December 8, the United States declared war on Japan, and several days later, on December 11, Germany and Italy each declared war on the U.S. The U.S. responded with a declaration of war against Germany and Italy. Domestic support for non-interventionism, which had been fading since the fall of France in 1940, disappeared. There were numerous historical precedents for unannounced military action by Japan, but the lack of any formal warning, particularly while negotiations were still apparently ongoing, led President Franklin D. Roosevelt to proclaim December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Because the attack happened without a declaration of war and without explicit warning, the attack on Pearl Harbor was later judged in the Tokyo trials to be a war crime. Topic. Background to conflict Topic. Diplomatic background War between Japan and the United States had been a possibility that each nation had been aware of, and planned for, since the 1920s. The relationship between the two countries was cordial enough that they remained trading partners. Tensions did not seriously grow until Japan's invasion of Manchuria in 1931. Over the next decade, Japan expanded into China, leading to the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1937. Japan spent considerable effort trying to isolate China, and endeavored to secure enough independent resources to attain victory on the mainland. The Southern Operation was designed to assist these efforts. Starting in December 1937, events such as the Japanese attack on USS Panay, the Allison Incident, and the Nanking Massacre swung Western public opinion sharply against Japan. Fearing Japanese expansion, the United States, United Kingdom, and France assisted China with its loans for war supply contracts. In 1940, Japan invaded French Indochina, attempting to stymie the flow of supplies reaching China. The United States halted shipments of airplanes, parts, machine tools, and aviation gasoline to Japan, which the latter perceived as an unfriendly act. The United States did not stop oil exports, however, partly because of the prevailing sentiment in Washington, given Japanese dependence on American oil, such an action was likely to be considered an extreme provocation. In mid 1940, President Franklin D. Roosevelt moved the Pacific Fleet from San Diego to Hawaii. He also ordered a military buildup in the Philippines, taking both actions in the hope of discouraging Japanese aggression in the Far East. 
Because the Japanese high command was mistakenly certain any attack on the United Kingdom's Southeast Asian colonies, including Singapore, would bring the U.S. into the war, a devastating preventive strike appeared to be the only way to prevent American naval interference. An invasion of the Philippines was also considered necessary by Japanese war planners. The U.S. War Plan Orange had envisioned defending the Philippines with an elite force of 40,000 men. This option was never implemented due to opposition from Douglas MacArthur, who felt he would need a force ten times that size. By 1941, U.S. planners expected to abandon the Philippines at the outbreak of war. Late that year, Admiral Thomas C. Hart, commander of the Asiatic Fleet, was given orders to that effect. The U.S. finally ceased oil exports to Japan in July 1941, following the seizure of French Indochina after the fall of France, in part because of new American restrictions on domestic oil consumption. Because of this decision, Japan proceeded with plans to take the oil rich Dutch East Indies. On August 17, Roosevelt warned Japan that America was prepared to take opposing steps if neighboring countries were attacked. The Japanese were faced with a dichotomy. Either withdraw from China and lose face, or seize new sources of raw materials in the resource-rich European colonies of Southeast Asia. Japan and the U.S. engaged in negotiations during 1941, attempting to improve relations. In the course of these negotiations, Japan offered to withdraw from most of China and Indochina after making peace with the nationalist government. It also proposed to adopt an independent interpretation of the Tripartite Pact and to refrain from trade discrimination, provided all other nations reciprocated. Washington rejected these proposals. Japanese Prime Minister Kanoi then offered to meet with Roosevelt, but Roosevelt insisted on reaching an agreement before any meeting. The U.S. ambassador to Japan repeatedly urged Roosevelt to accept the meeting, warning that it was the only way to preserve the conciliatory Kanoi government and peace in the Pacific. However, his recommendation was not acted upon. The Kanoi government collapsed the following month. When the Japanese military rejected a withdrawal of all troops from China, Japan's final proposal, delivered on November 20, offered to withdraw from southern Indochina and to refrain from attacks in Southeast Asia, so long as the United States, United Kingdom, and Netherlands ceased aid to China and lifted their sanctions against Japan. The American counter proposal of November 26, November 27 in Japan, the Hull Note, required Japan completely evacuate China without conditions and conclude non aggression pacts with Pacific powers. On November 26 in Japan, the day before the note's delivery, the Japanese task force left port for Pearl Harbor. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Military planning. Preliminary planning for an attack on Pearl Harbor to protect the move into the Southern Resource Area, the Japanese term for the Dutch East Indies and Southeast Asia generally, had begun very early in 1941 under the auspices of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, then commanding Japan's combined fleet. He won assent to formal planning and training for an attack from the Imperial Japanese Navy General Staff only after much contention with naval headquarters, including a threat to resign his command. Full-scale planning was underway by early spring 1941, primarily by Rear Admiral Ryunosuke Kusaka, with assistance from Captain Minoru Genda and Yamamoto's Deputy Chief of Staff, Captain Kometo Kuroshima. The planners studied the 1940 British air attack on the Italian fleet at Taranto intensively. Over the next several months, pilots were trained, equipment was adapted, and intelligence was collected. Despite these preparations, Emperor Hirohito did not approve the attack plan until November 5, after the third of four imperial conferences called to consider the matter. Final authorization was not given by the emperor until December 1, after a majority of Japanese leaders advised him the Hull Note would destroy the fruits of the China incident, endanger Manchukuo, and undermine Japanese control of Korea. By late 1941, many observers believed that hostilities between the U.S. and Japan were imminent. A Gallup poll just before the attack on Pearl Harbor found that 52% of Americans expected war with Japan, 27% did not, and 21% had no opinion. While U.S. Pacific bases and facilities had been placed on alert on many occasions, U.S. officials doubted Pearl Harbor would be the first target, instead, they expected the Philippines would be attacked first. This presumption was due to the threat that the air bases throughout the country and the naval base at Manila posed to sea lanes, as well as to the shipment of supplies to Japan from territory to the south. 
They also incorrectly believed that Japan was not capable of mounting more than one major naval operation at a time. Topic. Objectives The Japanese attack had several major aims. First, it intended to destroy important American fleet units, thereby preventing the Pacific Fleet from interfering with Japanese conquest of the Dutch East Indies and Malaya and to enable Japan to conquer Southeast Asia without interference. Second, it was hoped to buy time for Japan to consolidate its position and increase its naval strength before shipbuilding authorized by the 1940 Vincent Walsh Act erased any chance of victory. Third, to deliver a blow to America's ability to mobilize its forces in the Pacific, battleships were chosen as the main targets, since they were the prestige ships of any navy at the time. Finally, it was hoped that the attack would undermine American morale such that the U.S. government would drop its demands contrary to Japanese interests, and would seek a compromise peace with Japan. Striking the Pacific Fleet at anchor in Pearl Harbor carried two distinct disadvantages. The targeted ships would be in very shallow water, so it would be relatively easy to salvage and possibly repair them, and most of the crews would survive the attack, since many would be on shore leave or would be rescued from the harbor. A further important disadvantage, this of timing, and known to the Japanese, was the absence from Pearl Harbor of all three of the U.S. Pacific Fleet's aircraft carriers Enterprise, Lexington, and Saratoga. IJN Top Command was attached to Admiral Mahan's decisive battle doctrine, especially that of destroying the maximum number of battleships. Despite these concerns, Yamamoto decided to press ahead. Japanese confidence in their ability to achieve a short, victorious war also meant other targets in the harbor, especially the Navy Yard, oil tank farms, and submarine base, were ignored, since, by their thinking, the war would be over before the influence of these facilities would be felt. Topic. Approach and attack On November 26, 1941, a Japanese task force, the striking force of six aircraft carriers, Akaji, Kaga, Soryu, Harayu, Shokaku, and Zuikaku, departed Hitokapu Bay on Kasatka, now Iterup Island in the Kuril Islands, en route to a position northwest of Hawaii, intending to launch its 408 aircraft to attack Pearl Harbor, 360 for the two attack waves and 48 on defensive combat air patrol cap, including nine fighters from the first wave. The first wave was to be the primary attack, while the second wave was to attack carriers as its first objective and cruisers as its second, with battleships as the third target. The first wave carried most of the weapons to attack capital ships, mainly specially adapted Type 91 aerial torpedoes which were designed with an anti-roll mechanism and a rudder extension that let them operate in shallow water. The aircrews were ordered to select the highest value targets battleships and aircraft carriers or, if these were not present, any other high-value ships cruisers and destroyers. First wave dive bombers were to attack ground targets. Fighters were ordered to strafe and destroy as many parked aircraft as possible to ensure they did not get into the air to intercept the bombers, especially in the first wave. When the fighters' fuel got low they were to refuel at the aircraft carriers and return to combat. Fighters were to serve cap duties where needed, especially over U.S. airfields. Before the attack commenced, two reconnaissance aircraft launched from cruisers Chikuma and Tone were sent to scout over Oahu and Maui and report on U.S. fleet composition and location. Reconnaissance aircraft flights risked alerting the U.S., and were not necessary. U.S. fleet composition and preparedness information in Pearl Harbor was already known due to the reports of the Japanese spy Takeo Yoshikawa. A report of the absence of the U.S. fleet in Lahaina Anchorage off Maui was received from the fleet submarine I-72. Another four scout planes patrolled the area between the Japanese carrier force the Kido Butai and Niihau, to detect any counterattack. Topic. Submarines Fleet submarines I-16, I-18, I-20, I-22, and I-24 each embarked a Type A midget submarine for transport to the waters off Oahu. The 5 I boats left Kerr Naval District on November 25, 1941. On December 6, they came to within 10 nmi 19 km, 12 miles of the mouth of Pearl Harbor and launched their midget subs at about 1 o'clock local time on December 7. At 3.42 Hawaiian time, the minesweeper Condor spotted a midget submarine periscope southwest of the Pearl Harbor entrance buoy and alerted the destroyer ward. 
The midget may have entered Pearl Harbor. However, Ward sank another midget submarine at 6.37 in the first American shots in the Pacific Theater. A midget submarine on the north side of Ford Island missed the seaplane tender Curtis with her first torpedo and missed the attacking destroyer Monaghan with her other one before being sunk by Monaghan at 8.43. A third midget submarine, HA-19, grounded twice, once outside the harbor entrance and again on the east side of Oahu, where it was captured on December 8. Ensign Kazuo Sakamaki swam ashore and was captured by Hawaii National Guard Corporal David Akui, becoming the first Japanese prisoner of war. A fourth had been damaged by a depth charge attack and was abandoned by its crew before it could fire its torpedoes. Japanese forces received a radio message from a midget submarine at 041 on December 8 claiming damage to one or more large warships inside Pearl Harbor. In 1992, 2000, and 2001, Hawaii Undersea Research Laboratories submersibles found the wreck of the fifth midget submarine lying in three parts outside Pearl Harbor. The wreck was in the debris field where much surplus U.S. equipment was dumped after the war, including vehicles and landing craft. Both of its torpedoes were missing. This correlates with reports of two torpedoes fired at the light cruiser St. Louis at 10.04 at the entrance of Pearl Harbor, and a possible torpedo fired at destroyer Helm at 8.21. Japanese declaration of war The attack took place before any formal declaration of war was made by Japan, but this was not Admiral Yamamoto's intention. He originally stipulated that the attack should not commence until 30 minutes after Japan had informed the United States that peace negotiations were at an end. However, the attack began before the notice could be delivered. Tokyo transmitted the 5,000-word notification commonly called the 14-part message in two blocks to the Japanese embassy in Washington. Transcribing the message took too long for the Japanese ambassador to deliver it on schedule. In the event, it was not presented until more than an hour after the attack began. In fact, U.S. code breakers had already deciphered and translated most of the message hours before he was scheduled to deliver it. The final part is sometimes described as a declaration of war. While it was viewed by a number of senior U.S. government and military officials as a very strong indicator negotiations were likely to be terminated and that war might break out at any moment, it neither declared war nor severed diplomatic relations. A declaration of war was printed on the front page of Japan's newspapers in the evening edition of December 8, but not delivered to the U.S. government until the day after the attack. For decades, conventional wisdom held that Japan attacked without first formally breaking diplomatic relations only because of accidents and bumbling that delayed the delivery of a document hinting at war to Washington. In 1999, however, Takeo Aguchi, a professor of law and international relations at International Christian University in Tokyo, discovered documents that pointed to a vigorous debate inside the government over how, and indeed whether, to notify Washington of Japan's intention to break off negotiations and start a war, including a December 7 entry in the war diary saying, Oh, er deceptive diplomacy is steadily proceeding toward success. Of this, Aguchi said. The diary shows that the Army and Navy did not want to give any proper declaration of war, or indeed prior notice even of the termination of negotiations. and they clearly prevailed. In any event, even if the Japanese had decoded and delivered the 14 part message before the beginning of the attack, it would not have constituted either a formal break of diplomatic relations or a declaration of war. The final two paragraphs of the message read, Thus the earnest hope of the Japanese government to adjust Japanese-American relations and to preserve and promote the peace of the Pacific through cooperation with the American government has finally been lost. The Japanese government regrets to have to notify hereby the American government that in view of the attitude of the American government it cannot but consider that it is impossible to reach an agreement through further negotiations. Topic. First wave composition The first attack wave of 183 planes was launched north of Oahu, led by Commander Mitsuo Fuchida. Six planes failed to launch due to technical difficulties. It included First Group, Targets, Battleships and Aircraft Carriers 49 Nakajima B-5N Kate Bombers armed with 800 kg 1,760 pounds armor-piercing bombs, organized in four sections one failed to launch 
40 B-5N bombers armed with Type 91 torpedoes, also in four sections Second group targets, Ford Island and Wheeler Field 51 Aichi D-3A Val dive bombers armed with 550 pounds 249 kilograms general purpose bombs three failed to launch Third group targets, aircraft at Ford Island, Hickam Field, Wheeler Field, Barbers Point, Kaneohe 43 Mitsubishi A6M. Zero. Fighters for air control and strafing two failed to launch as the first wave approached Oahu, it was detected by the U.S. Army-270 Seychelles Rupees radar at Opana Point near the island's northern tip. This post had been in training mode for months, but was not yet operational. The operators, Privates George Elliott Jr. and Joseph Lockard, reported a target. But Lt. Kermit A. Tyler, a newly assigned officer at the thinly manned intercept center, presumed it was the scheduled arrival of six B-17 bombers from California. The Japanese planes were approaching from a direction very close only a few degrees difference to the bombers, and while the operators had never seen a formation as large on radar, they neglected to tell Tyler of its size. Tyler, for security reasons, could not tell the operators of the six B-17s that were due even though it was widely known, as the first wave planes approached Oahu, they encountered and shot down several U.S. aircraft. At least one of these radioed a somewhat incoherent warning. Other warnings from ships off the harbor entrance were still being processed or awaiting confirmation when the attacking planes began bombing and strafing. Nevertheless, it is not clear any warnings would have had much effect even if they had been interpreted correctly and much more promptly. The results the Japanese achieved in the Philippines were essentially the same as at Pearl Harbor, though MacArthur had almost nine hours warning that the Japanese had already attacked Pearl Harbor. The air portion of the attack began at 7.48 a.m. Hawaiian time, 3.18 a.m. December 8 Japanese Standard Time, as kept by ships of the Kido Butai, with the attack on Kaneohe. A total of 353 Japanese planes in two waves reached Oahu. Slow, vulnerable torpedo bombers led the first wave, exploiting the first moments of surprise to attack the most important ships present the battleships, while dive bombers attacked U.S. air bases across Oahu, starting with Hickam Field, the largest, and Wheeler Field, the main U.S. Army Air Force's fighter base. The 171 planes in the second wave attacked the Army Air Force's Bellows Field near Kaneohe on the windward side of the island, and Ford Island. The only aerial opposition came from a handful of P-36 Hawks, P-40 Warhawks, and some SBD Dauntless dive bombers from the carrier Enterprise. In the first wave attack, about eight of the 49 800 kilograms 1,760 pounds armor-piercing bombs dropped hit their intended battleship targets. At least two of those bombs broke up on impact, another detonated before penetrating an unarmored deck, and one was a dud. Thirteen of the forty torpedoes hit battleships, and four torpedoes hit other ships. Men aboard U.S. ships awoke to the sounds of alarms, bombs exploding, and gunfire, prompting bleary-eyed men to dress as they ran to general quarters stations. The famous message, Air Raid Pearl Harbor. This is not drill was sent from the headquarters of Patrol Wing 2, the first senior Hawaiian command to respond, the defenders were very unprepared. Ammunition lockers were locked, aircraft parked wingtip to wingtip in the open to prevent sabotage, guns unmanned none of the Navy's 5, 38s, only a quarter of its machine guns, and only four of 31 Army batteries got in action. Despite this low alert status, many American military personnel responded effectively during the attack. Ensign Joe Tausig Jr., aboard Nevada, commanded the ship's anti-aircraft guns and was severely wounded, but continued to be on post. Lieutenant Commander F.J. Thomas commanded Nevada in the captain's absence and got her underway until the ship was grounded at 9.10 a.m. One of the destroyers, Aylwin, got underway with only four officers aboard, all ensigns, none with more than a year's sea duty. She operated at sea for 36 hours before her commanding officer managed to get back aboard. Captain Mervyn Bennion, commanding West Virginia, led his men until he was cut down by fragments from a bomb which hit Tennessee, moored alongside. Topic. Second wave composition The second planned wave consisted of 171 planes, 54 B-5Ns, 81 D-3As, and 36 A-6Mis, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Shigekazu Shimazaki. Four planes failed to launch because of technical difficulties. 
This wave and its targets comprised First Group 54 B5Ns armed with 550 pounds (249 kilograms) and 132 pounds (60 kilograms) general purpose bombs. 27 B5Ns aircraft and hangars on Kaneohe, Ford Island, and Barbers Point. 27 B5Ns hangars and aircraft on Hickam Field. Second Group targets aircraft carriers and cruisers. 78D3 is armed with 550 pounds (249 kilograms) general-purpose bombs in four sections, three aborted. Third group targets aircraft at Fort Island, Hickam Field, Wheeler Field, Barbers Point, Kaneohe. 35A6 MIS for defense and strafing, one aborted. The second wave was divided into three groups. One was tasked to attack Kaneohe, the rest Pearl Harbor proper. The separate sections arrived at the attack point almost simultaneously from several directions. Topic: American casualties and damage. 90 minutes after it began, the attack was over. 2008 sailors were killed and 710 others wounded. 218 soldiers and airmen who were part of the army until the independent US Air Force was formed in 1947 were killed and 364 wounded. 109 marines were killed and 69 wounded and 68 civilians were killed and 35 wounded. In total, 2335 American servicemen were killed and 1143 were wounded. Eighteen ships were sunk or run aground, including five battleships. All of the Americans killed or wounded during the attack were non-combatants, given the fact there was no state of war when the attack occurred. Of the American fatalities, nearly half were due to the explosion of Arizona's forward magazine after it was hit by a modified 16-inch shell, already damaged by a torpedo and on fire amidships, Nevada attempted to exit the harbor. She was targeted by many Japanese bombers as she got underway and sustained more hits from 250 pounds 113 kilograms bombs, which started further fires. She was deliberately beached to avoid blocking the harbor entrance. California was hit by two bombs and two torpedoes. The crew might have kept her afloat, but were ordered to abandon ship just as they were raising power for the pumps. Burning oil from Arizona and West Virginia drifted down on her, and probably made the situation look worse than it was. The disarmed target ship Utah was holed twice by torpedoes. West Virginia was hit by seven torpedoes, the seventh tearing away her rudder. Oklahoma was hit by four torpedoes, the last two above her belt armor, which caused her to capsize. Maryland was hit by two of the converted 16 inches shells, but neither caused serious damage. Although the Japanese concentrated on battleships the largest vessels present, they did not ignore other targets. The light cruiser Helena was torpedoed, and the concussion from the blast capsized the neighboring minelayer Oglala. Two destroyers in dry dock, Kassin and Downs were destroyed when bombs penetrated their fuel bunkers. The leaking fuel caught fire, flooding the dry dock in an effort to fight fire made the burning oil rise, and both were burned out. Kassin slipped from her keel blocks and rolled against Downs. The light cruiser Raleigh was holed by a torpedo. The light cruiser Honolulu was damaged, but remained in service. The repair vessel Vestal, moored alongside Arizona, was heavily damaged and beached. The seaplane tender Curtis was also damaged. The destroyer Shaw was badly damaged when two bombs penetrated her forward magazine. Of the 402 American aircraft in Hawaii, 188 were destroyed and 159 damaged, 155 of them on the ground. Almost none were actually ready to take off to defend the base. Eight Army Air Forces pilots managed to get airborne during the attack and six were credited with downing at least one Japanese aircraft during the attack, 1st Lieutenant Louis M. Sanders, 2nd Lieutenant Philip M. Rasmussen, 2nd Lieutenant Kenneth M. Taylor, 2nd Lieutenant George S. Welch, 2nd Lieutenant Harry W. Brown, and 2nd Lieutenant Gordon H. Sterling Jr. Sterling was shot down by Lieutenant Fujita over Kaneohe Bay and is listed as body not recovered not missing in action. Lieutenant John L. Danes was killed by friendly fire returning from a victory over Kawa. Of 33 PBYs in Hawaii, 24 were destroyed, and six others damaged beyond repair. The three on patrol returned undamaged. Friendly fire brought down some U.S. planes on top of that, including five from an inbound flight from Enterprise. Japanese attacks on barracks killed additional personnel. 
At the time of the attack, nine civilian aircraft were flying in the vicinity of Pearl Harbor. Of these, three were shot down. Topic. Japanese losses 55 Japanese airmen and nine submariners were killed in the attack, and one was captured. Of Japan's 414 available planes, 29 were lost during the battle 9 in the first attack wave, 20 in the second, with another 74 damaged by anti-aircraft fire from the ground. Topic. Possible third wave Several Japanese junior officers including Fuchida and Genda urged Nagumo to carry out a third strike in order to destroy as much of Pearl Harbor's fuel and torpedo storage, maintenance, and dry dock facilities as possible. Genda, who had unsuccessfully advocated for invading Hawaii after the air attack, believed that without an invasion, three strikes were necessary to disable the base as much as possible. The captains of the other five carriers in the task force reported they were willing and ready to carry out a third strike. Military historians have suggested the destruction of these shore facilities would have hampered the U.S. Pacific Fleet far more seriously than the loss of its battleships. If they had been wiped out, serious American operations in the Pacific would have been postponed for more than a year. According to Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, later commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet, it would have prolonged the war another two years. Nagumo, however, decided to withdraw for several reasons. American anti-aircraft performance had improved considerably during the second strike, and two-thirds of Japan's losses were incurred during the second wave. Nagumo felt if he launched a third strike, he would be risking three-quarters of the combined fleet's strength to wipe out the remaining targets which included the facilities while suffering higher aircraft losses. The location of the American carriers remained unknown. In addition, the Admiral was concerned his force was now within range of American land-based bombers. Nagumo was uncertain whether the U.S. had enough surviving planes remaining on Hawaii to launch an attack against his carriers. A third wave would have required substantial preparation and turnaround time, and would have meant returning planes would have had to land at night. At the time, only the Royal Navy had developed night carrier techniques, so this was a substantial risk. The task force's fuel situation did not permit him to remain in waters north of Pearl Harbor much longer, since he was at the very limit of logistical support. To do so risked running unacceptably low on fuel, perhaps even having to abandon destroyers en route home. He believed the second strike had essentially satisfied the main objective of his mission—the neutralization of the Pacific Fleet—and did not wish to risk further losses. Moreover, it was Japanese Navy practice to prefer the conservation of strength over the total destruction of the enemy. At a conference aboard his flagship the following morning, Yamamoto supported Nagumo's withdrawal without launching a third wave. In retrospect, sparing the vital dockyards, maintenance shops, and the oil tank farm meant the U.S. could respond relatively quickly to Japanese activities in the Pacific. Yamamoto later regretted Nagumo's decision to withdraw and categorically stated it had been a great mistake not to order a third strike. Topic. Ships lost or damaged 21 ships were damaged or lost in the attack, of which all but three were repaired and returned to service. Topic. Battleships Arizona RADM Kids flagship of Battleship Division 1, hit by four armor-piercing bombs, exploded, total loss, 1,177 dead. Oklahoma, hit by five torpedoes, capsized, total loss. 429 dead. West Virginia, hit by two bombs, seven torpedoes, sunk, returned to service July 1944. 106 dead. California, hit by two bombs, two torpedoes, sunk, returned to service January 1944. 100 dead. Nevada, hit by six bombs, one torpedo, beached, returned to service October 1942. 60 dead. Pennsylvania ADM Kimmel's flagship of the United States Pacific Fleet, in dry dock with Cassin and Downs, hit by one bomb and debris from USS Cassin, remained in service. Nine dead. Tennessee, hit by two bombs, returned to service February 1942. Five dead. Maryland, hit by two bombs, returned to service February 1942. 
Four dead, including float plane pilot, shot down. Topic X battleship target double A training ship. Utah hit by two torpedoes, capsized, total loss, sixty four dead. Topic cruisers. Helena, hit by one torpedo, returned to service January 1942. 20 dead. Raleigh, hit by one torpedo, returned to service February 1942. Honolulu, near miss, light damage, remained in service. Topic. Destroyers Cassin, in dry dock with Downs and Pennsylvania, hit by one bomb, burned, returned to service February 1944. Downs, in dry dock with Cassin and Pennsylvania, caught fire from Cassin, burned, returned to service November 1943. Helm, underway to West Lock, damaged by two near miss bombs, continued patrol, dry docked 15 January 1942 and sailed 20 January 1942. Shaw, hit by three bombs, returned to service June 1942. Topic. Auxiliaries Oglala mine layer, damaged by torpedo hit on Helena, capsized, returned to service as engine repair ship February 1944. Vestal repair ship, hit by two bombs, blast and fire from Arizona, beached, returned to service by August 1942. Curtis seaplane tender, hit by one bomb, one crashed Japanese aircraft, returned to service January 1942. 19 dead. Sotoyomo harbor tug, damaged by explosion and fires in Shaw, sunk, returned to service August 1942. YFD-2 yard floating dock, damaged by 250 kg bombs, sunk, returned to service 25 January 1942 servicing Shaw. Topic. Salvage After a systematic search for survivors, formal salvage operations began. Captain Homer N. Wallen, Material Officer for Commander, Battle Force, U.S. Pacific Fleet, was immediately ordered to lead salvage operations. Within a short time I was relieved of all other duties and ordered to full-time work as Fleet Salvage Officer. Around Pearl Harbor, divers from the Navy shore and tenders, the naval shipyard, and civilian contractors Pacific Bridge and others began work on the ships that could be refloated. They patched holes, cleared debris, and pumped water out of ships. Navy divers worked inside the damaged ships. Within six months, five battleships and two cruisers were patched or refloated so they could be sent to shipyards in Pearl Harbor and on the mainland for extensive repair. Intensive salvage operations continued for another year, a total of some 20,000 man-hours underwater. Oklahoma, while successfully raised, was never repaired, and capsized while under tow to the mainland in 1947. Arizona and the target ship Utah were too heavily damaged for salvage, though much of their armament and equipment was removed and put to use aboard other vessels. Today, the two hulks remain where they were sunk, with Arizona becoming a war memorial. Aftermath In the wake of the attack, 15 medals of honor, 51 Navy crosses, 53 silver stars, 4 Navy and Marine Corps medals, 1 Distinguished Flying Cross, 4 Distinguished Service Crosses, 1 Distinguished Service Medal, and 3 Bronze Star Medals were awarded to the American servicemen who distinguished themselves in combat at Pearl Harbor. Additionally, a special military award, the Pearl Harbor Commemorative Medal, was later authorized for all military veterans of the attack. The day after the attack, Roosevelt delivered his famous infamy speech to a joint session of Congress, calling for a formal declaration of war on the Empire of Japan. Congress obliged his request less than an hour later. On December 11, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States, even though the Tripartite Pact did not require it. Congress issued a declaration of war against Germany and Italy later that same day. The UK actually declared war on Japan nine hours before the US did, partially due to Japanese attacks on Malaya, Singapore and Hong Kong, and partially due to Winston Churchill's promise to declare war within the hour of a Japanese attack on the United States. 
The attack was an initial shock to all the Allies in the Pacific theater. Further losses compounded the alarming setback. Japan attacked the Philippines hours later because of the time difference, it was December 8 in the Philippines. Only three days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the battleships Prince of Wales and Repulse were sunk off the coast of Malaya, causing British Prime Minister Winston Churchill later to recollect, "...in all the war one never received a more direct shock. As I turned and twisted in bed the full horror of the news sank in upon me." There were no British or American capital ships in the Indian Ocean or the Pacific except the American survivors of Pearl Harbor who were hastening back to California. Over this vast expanse of waters Japan was supreme and we everywhere were weak and naked." Throughout the war, Pearl Harbor was frequently used in American propaganda. One further consequence of the attack on Pearl Harbor and its aftermath notably the Niihau incident was that Japanese-American residents and citizens were relocated to nearby Japanese-American internment camps. Within hours of the attack, hundreds of Japanese-American leaders were rounded up and brought to high-security camps such as Sand Island at the mouth of Honolulu Harbor and Kilauea military camp on the island of Hawaii. Eventually, more than 110,000 Japanese Americans, nearly all who lived on the West Coast, were forced into interior camps, but in Hawaii, where the 150,000 plus Japanese Americans composed over one third of the population, only 1,200 to 1,800 were interned. The attack also had international consequences. The Canadian province of British Columbia, bordering the Pacific Ocean, had long had a large population of Japanese immigrants and their Japanese Canadian descendants. Pre-war tensions were exacerbated by the Pearl Harbor attack, leading to a reaction from the Government of Canada. On February 24, 1942, Order in Council PC No. 1486 was passed under the War Measures Act allowing for the forced removal of any and all Canadians of Japanese descent from British Columbia, as well as the prohibiting them from returning to the province. On 4 March, regulations under the Act were adopted to evacuate Japanese Canadians. As a result, 12,000 were interned in interior camps, 2,000 were sent to road camps and another 2,000 were forced to work in the prairies at sugar beet farms. Niihau <inaudible> <inaudible> incident The Japanese planners had determined that some means was required for rescuing flyers whose aircraft were too badly damaged to return to the carriers. The island of Niihau, only 30 minutes flying time from Pearl Harbor, was designated as the rescue point. The Zero flown by Petty Officer Shigenori Nishikaichi of Harayu was damaged in the attack on Wheeler, so he flew to the rescue point on Niihau. The aircraft was further damaged on landing. Nishikaichi was helped from the wreckage by one of the native Hawaiians, who, aware of the tension between the United States and Japan, took the pilot's maps and other documents. The island's residents had no telephones or radio and were completely unaware of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Nishikaichi enlisted the support of three Japanese-American residents in an attempt to recover the documents. During the ensuing struggles, Nishikaichi was killed and a Hawaiian civilian was wounded, one collaborator committed suicide, and his wife and the third collaborator were sent to prison. The ease with which the local ethnic Japanese residents had apparently gone to the assistance of Nishikaichi was a source of concern for many, and tended to support those who believed that local Japanese could not be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> Strategic implications Admiral Hara Tadaichi summed up the Japanese result by saying, We won a great tactical victory at Pearl Harbor and thereby lost the war. To a similar effect, see Isoroku Yamamoto's alleged sleeping giant. Quote. While the attack accomplished its intended objective, it turned out to be largely unnecessary. Unbeknownst to Yamamoto, who conceived the original plan, the U.S. Navy had decided as far back as 1935 to abandon charging across the Pacific towards the Philippines in response to an outbreak of war in keeping with the evolution of Plan Orange. The U.S. instead adopted Plan Dog in 1940, which emphasized keeping the IJN out of the Eastern Pacific and away from the shipping lanes to Australia, while the U.S. concentrated on defeating Nazi Germany. Fortunately for the United States, the American aircraft carriers were untouched by the Japanese attack, otherwise the Pacific Fleet's ability to conduct offensive operations would have been crippled for a year or more given no diversions from the Atlantic Fleet. 
As it was, the elimination of the battleships left the U.S. Navy with no choice but to rely on its aircraft carriers and submarines—the very weapons with which the U.S. Navy halted and eventually reversed the Japanese advance. While six of the eight battleships were repaired and returned to service, their relatively low speed and high fuel consumption limited their deployment, and they served mainly in shore bombardment roles their only major action being the Battle of Surigao Strait in October 1944. A major flaw of Japanese strategic thinking was a belief that the ultimate Pacific battle would be fought by battleships, in keeping with the doctrine of Captain Alfred Thayer Mahon. As a result, Yamamoto and his successors hoarded battleships for a decisive battle that never happened. The Japanese confidence in their ability to achieve a short, victorious war meant that they neglected Pearl Harbor's Navy repair yards, oil tank farms, submarine base, and old headquarters building. All of these targets were omitted from Genda's list, yet they proved more important than any battleship to the American war efforts in the Pacific. The survival of the repair shops and fuel depots allowed Pearl Harbor to maintain logistical support to the U.S. Navy's operations, such as the Doolittle Raid and the battles of Coral Sea and Midway. It was submarines that immobilized the Imperial Japanese Navy's heavy ships and brought Japan's economy to a virtual standstill by crippling the transportation of oil and raw materials. By the end of 1942, import of raw materials was cut to half of what it had been, to a disastrous 10 million tons, while oil import was almost completely stopped. Lastly, the basement of the old administration building was the home of the cryptanalytic unit which contributed significantly to the Midway ambush and the submarine force's success. Topic. Retrospective debate on American intelligence Ever since the Japanese attack, there has been debate as to how and why the United States had been caught unaware, and how much and when American officials knew of Japanese plans and related topics. Military officers including Gen. Billy Mitchell had pointed out the vulnerability of Pearl to air attack. At least two naval war games, one in 1932 and another in 1936, proved that Pearl was vulnerable to such an attack. Admiral James Richardson was removed from command shortly after protesting President Roosevelt's decision to move the bulk of the Pacific Fleet to Pearl Harbor. The decisions of military and political leadership to ignore these warnings has contributed to conspiracy theories. Several writers, including journalist Robert Stinnett and former United States Rear Admiral Robert Alfred Theobald, have argued that various parties high in the U.S. and British governments knew of the attack in advance and may even have let it happen or encouraged it in order to force the U.S. into war via the so-called back door. However, this conspiracy theory is rejected by mainstream historians. Topic. In popular culture Topic. See also Topic. References Informational notes Citations Bibliography Further reading Topic. External links Navy History Heritage Command Official Overview History. Com account with video about education account Remembering Pearl Harbor, the USS Arizona Memorial, a National Park Service teaching with historic places TWHP, Lesson Plan Hawaii War Records Depository, Archives and Manuscripts Department, University of Hawaii at Manoa Library 7 December 1941, the Air Force story The Magic Background PDFs are readable online The Congressional Investigation LTC Jeffrey J. Goodmans, Colonel Timothy R. Reese 2009. Staff Ride Handbook for the Attack on Pearl Harbor, 7 December 1941, A Study of Defending America PDF Report. Combat Studies Institute, Accounts Guarding the United States and its Outposts, in Guarding the United States and its Outposts Official U.S. Army History of Pearl Harbor by the United States Army Center of Military History War comes to Hawaii Honolulu Star Bulletin, Monday, September 13, 1999 Media video of first newsreel from December 23, 1941 Attack on Pearl Harbor Bombing of Pearl Harbor 1941 Attack on Pearl Harbor 1, Nippon News, No. 82, in the official web website of NHK. Attack on Pearl Harbor 2, Nippon News, No. 84, in the official website of NHK.
Historic footage of Pearl Harbor during and immediately following attack on December 7, 1941 Historical documents WW2DB, U.S. Navy report of Japanese raid on Pearl Harbor Second World War, USA declaration of war on Japan. Collection of extensive Japanese preparation military documents. <laughs>